There are links to the weapon damage guide and bow and bow gun damage guides in the description. I'll be covering them a bit later. Well, here we are. I want to first say that I'm not a genius, and I'm sure I won't be able to cover every single thing about every part of this game, regardless of how many videos I make, but I will share what I know, and you can build onto that if you want. Um, let's start with something simple. Here I have all of the starting weapons, separated into their weapon classes. There is sword and shield, dual blades, lance, gun lance, great sword, long sword, hammer, hunting horn, and bow, light bow gun, and heavy bow gun. You might notice that hammers and hunting horns deal more damage than all other types of weapons. The game even reinforces this by showing the comparison as red for lower, and blue for higher. Unfortunately, this is very misleading. What's going on here is that the values you see have been artificially bloated. There could be a handful of reasons why the developers decided to do this, the most likely being that the motion values for each weapon are different, and some are higher than others. For example, the motion value of the first triangle attack for sword and shield is 14, while the first triangle attack for a hammer is 52. The sword and shield is doing about 27% of how much the hammer is. When comparing those two attacks, that's less than half. I can imagine that Capcom wanted to show at a glance how much damage individual hits would do, as compared to the actual damage of the weapon. Keep in mind when choosing a weapon type to compare values with the same class of weapon, like a longsword to a longsword, or as you can see here, a longsword to a greatsword. What does all of this mean? Well, all of the melee weapons here do the same amount of damage. The values have just been bloated. They are bloated by multiplying the raw values by the weapon class modifiers. You can get the raw values by dividing by those same modifiers. The sword and shield and dual blades both have attack values of 98. The class modifier for them is 1.4. 98 divided by 1.4 is 70. The lance and gun lance both have attack values of 161. The class modifier for them is 2.3. 161 divided by 2.3 is 70. The greatsword and longsword are both 336. Class modifier for them is 4.8. 336 divided by 4.8 is 70. The hammer and hunting horn are both 364. The class modifier for them is 5.2. 364 divided by 5.2 is, you guessed it, 70. Now, for the bow and light bow gun, they're both 96, and their class modifier is 1.2. 96 divided by 1.2 is 80. And for the heavy bow gun, it's 156. The class modifier is the same as the bow and light bow gun at 1.2. 156 divided by 1.2 is 130. I also want to mention really quick that all displayed elemental and status values in the game are bloated by a factor of 10. That super slick Plesioth Azure blade of yours with the huge 620 water element is actually just 62. Which, as far as elemental damage is concerned, is still pretty good. But it's important to understand that raw damage will often beat elemental bonuses in terms of final damage. Elemental damage has its place, absolutely, especially for ranged weapons, or in the late game, but it's something to think about. Also, on the topic of status, Every time you hit an enemy with a weapon with a status effect on it, like poison, there is only a chance that it will actually apply that status. I've seen some people say it's about a 25% chance, while Gaijin Hunter says it's 33%, like 1 in 3. But he was talking about Monster Hunter 4 Ultimate. That's why sometimes the monster you're fighting will be put to sleep or paralyzed, etc. a bit faster than you might be used to, because as far as I'm aware it's based on RNG. More on that later. So why should you care that the values are bloated? Beyond having a clearer understanding of the game, this is useful when calculating the damage of an attack, or in determining the potential of a weapon, or comparing weapons from different weapon classes. Like I said earlier, all of these starting melee weapons, they deal the same amount of damage. Except, that's not exactly true. So let's talk about that. Melee weapons all have a sharpness value. There's both the length and quality of the sharpness. Length of the sharpness will determine how many attacks you can land before the sharpness decreases. Keep in mind if your attack bounces, it will damage your sharpness more than usual, but still deal the same amount of damage. 
There are a few skills that affect sharpness, but I won't be going over them in this video. Instead, let's talk about multiplication. There are seven sharpness levels in Freedom Unite. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, white, and purple. Each sharpness level will multiply your damage per hit by a certain amount, with red and orange actually decreasing your damage. With red sharpness, you'll deal 50% of your normal damage. Orange, you'll deal 75% of your normal damage. Yellow does not change your damage. Green will give you 12.5% more damage, blue is 25% more, white is 30% more, and purple is 50% more. A greatsword with an attack power or ATP value of 480, which is a raw of 100, with red sharpness will have a raw value of 50, with yellow it would be a deal 100, and with purple it would deal 150. The multiplier from sharpness is very powerful, and it can change throughout the course of a fight. This is a big reason to maintain your sharpness throughout a fight, to make sure you keep doing a good amount of damage. Of course, the higher your sharpness level, the less likely you are to bounce as well. If your sharpness drops to red, you may bounce a lot. If your sharpness is at purple, you may cut through some spots that other sharpness levels couldn't. There are ways to get around th this through skills and some weapons internal mechanics, but you will want to be hitting the soft spots anyways to be dealing the most damage. Back to multiplying, sharpness also affects your elemental and status values, though to a lesser degree than raw does. With red sharpness, your element and status is only 25% as effective, orange is only 50% as effective, yellow is only 75% as effective, green is no change, blue is an increase of 6.25%, white is an increase of 12.5%, purple is an increase of 20%. Unfortunately, with how low the true element and status values are, the sharpness modifiers don't do nearly as much as it does to raw. It's still worth considering, of course. Remember that these sharpness levels will change as you lose sharpness. Just because your weapon has purple sharpness when full, doesn't mean it will keep giving you the purple sharpness multiplier once it drops to white. So keep your weapon sharpened, it's important. Affinity. When positive, gives your weapons a chance to deal 25% more damage. We call this a critical hit, or critical strike. In short, affinity is your crit rate. While an increase of 25% is very nice, it's important to understand the nature of RNG. While it's extremely unlikely to have 90% affinity and never crit, it is technically possible. So, how are we supposed to account for random chance? Well. While a weapon with 10 affinity does have the potential to deal 25% more damage, we can consider the 10% affinity as a damage increase of 2.5%, which is 10% of 25%, which is the critical strike multiplier. While this isn't really perfect, it's a good way to somewhat objectively look at and compare affinity to other methods of boosting damage, such as the attack up and sharpness plus one skills. Consider this. Reckless Abandon plus three gives you a 30% crit chance. Again, that's a 30% chance to deal 25% more damage. Attack up large gives you 20 more raw damage and there's no chance involved in that. Also consider that Reckless Abandon plus 3, with an increase of 30% affinity, translates into a damage increase of roughly 7.5%. At attack values of 260 and lower, attack up large is simply better than Reckless Abandon plus 3. This is because a 25% increase means more the higher your base damage is, and less the lower it is. RA plus 3 simply isn't that good in the early game, but really shines once you get closer to end game. Also, negative affinity is the chance to deal 25% less damage, but if we use the same method of getting a general idea of what that means for us, you can see that it isn't as bad as you might think, especially since weapons with negative affinity tend to have pretty high base damage anyways. Take the Tigrex weapons for example. The Tiger Agito has an effective damage rating of about 196 after considering its blue sharpness and 30% affinity. That's higher than the Chrome Razor, which is about 191, which has the same base damage, neutral affinity, but lower sharpness. So, like I said before, all elemental and status values are bloated. You can easily figure out the true value by dividing it by 10, or by just removing the zero at the end. You can see the true Devil Slicer here has a Thunder Attribute of 520, removing the zero gives you 52. Typically, the faster a weapon attacks or hits a monster, the more effective it will be with elements and status, status being chance-based especially. You can sort of think of elemental damage as an extra additive layer of damage. Let's do a bit of math. More on hit zones later, but... Yan Kutku has an ice hit zone of 40 on its head. That means it's only 40% of elemental damage will actually come through when you hit it. Let's consider two weapons. The Steel Ice Blade, a great sword, and Steel Ice Dagger Plus, a sword and shield. Let's focus only on the elemental value, no sharpness or anything else. Both weapons have an ice value of 200, 
Removing the bloating gives us 20. Applying the ice hit zone from Kutkuk leaves us with 8. This is a very simplified look at what's going on, but it's useful for a comparison. With the greatsword, doing an unsheath attack and rolling takes about 2 seconds. In about the same time, a sword and shield can attack around 4 times. 1 times 8 equals 8. 4 times 8 equals 32, which is 4 times the elemental damage that the greatsword did. Obviously, there's more than just elemental to consider, such as motion values, sharpness, etc., but this is a good example of how, in a vacuum, elemental works better on a faster weapon. In some cases, out damaging their raw counterparts, like when using Dragon Elemental Bow on Shen Geor. Let's talk about status. Like I said before, with melee weapons, there is a chance to apply status with each hit. We'll say a 1 in 3 chance. Ranged weapons will always apply the status if you use the right ammo or coatings. There's more to it for ranged weapons, though. More on that later. You can see how the four hits in the same time as one example earlier translates well into this. Faster hitting weapons are better at applying status than slower ones. But how does status work? Firstly, status does not add extra damage per attack. Instead, when a monster is hit by a status proc, it will start to build up that ailment. You know Dark Souls? How when you stand in the water in Blight Town, it fills up your poison meter until it's triggered? This is the same concept. Assuming they're not immune, every monster has a starting threshold to hit with each status type, including being KO'd from hammers and hunting horns, and crag shots. Every time you successfully trigger a status effect on a monster, it will gain a bit of resistance to that same status. The more you poison an enemy, the longer it will take for each time after the first. Also, if the monster isn't hit by a status ailment within a certain amount of time, usually 5 or 10 seconds, it will recover from a bit of that buildup, usually 5 or 10 points. This may not mean a whole lot over the course of like 20 or 30 seconds, but if you leave the monster for a few minutes, you'll have to make up for that difference if you want to inflict the status ailment on them. This recovery system makes it important for you to keep up the pressure when applying status, to make sure it doesn't recover enough to make things harder on you, especially once it's built up a resistance. Every monster's initial resistance is different, the amount of resistance gained per times they're afflicted is different, and the maximum threshold their resistance builds up to is different. Typically, it's only important to know what the initial resistance is and increase is, so you can determine whether or not it's worth it to try to inflict the status on them one or two times. The monster should be dead or captured before it reaches maximum resistance in most cases. It's important to note that some monsters can be hit with status effects, but some cannot. Notable examples are Yan Garuga being immune to poison, Queen Vespoid not being able to be stunned, and Lao Shenlong and Shen Georin being immune to all statuses and traps completely. How can I do more damage, is a question that so many people like to ask without really considering why. Regardless, there are many ways to increase your damage, some are more situational than others. The Power Charm and Power Talon stack and increase your damage as long as they're in your inventory. They can't be stolen from you, so despite their cost, as long as you have two inventory spaces you should always have this in your inventory, no exceptions. The same goes for the Armor Charm and Armor Talon. Power Seeds, Power Pills, and the Demon Flute do not stack with each other. If you take a Power Seed and then a Power Pill, the Power Pill will override the 10 attack boost with its own 25, and the duration of 3 minutes with its own 20 seconds. The same with the Demon Flute, it will just replace the effect and duration of the previous buff. Demon Drugs, Mega Demon Drugs, and the Cat Kitchen buff are all the same category. The only reason to take Mega Demon Drugs is if you don't eat for the large attack buff in the kitchen. The only time to use Demon Drugs is if Mega Demon Drugs are too expensive for you to want to make. The difference in attack boost between these two is relatively minor, only 2 points, so it's your call. These buffs will last the whole hunt or until you cart, so if you really want to maintain the kitchen buff just in case you cart, you can bring Mega Demon Drugs then, but don't use them until after you've carted it and lost the food buff. It's worth noting that there is a kitchen skill called Feline Bonus Skills, which will keep the buffs gained from the kitchen after you cart. Attack up from armor skills is a unique buff, it'd be really strange if it weren't, and the Hunting Horn buff is multiplicative, that is, the higher your damage already is, the more it will benefit you. Minus the Hunting Horn buff, all of these will give you a combined bonus ATP of 67 if you use Power Pills. 52 if you're using power seeds. The hunting horn will increase those values to 80 and 62, but will actually be higher than that once added to your weapon's damage. The most likely situation you'll almost always be in is using the power charm and talon, power seeds, and the kitchen buff, which is 32 more attack power. That's not a small number, you want that. That 30 extra damage can also put you at or above 270 damage, which puts you in range to make Reckless Abandon plus 3 better than Attack Up Large, if you want that. In video games, when considering boosting stats, there's usually additive changes and multiplicative changes. An example of an additive change is taking a Power Seed. It will increase your raw attack power by 10, which of course shows in your status menu as being multiplied by the class modifier. That's why when you take a Power Seed with Sword and Shield, it shows you as getting 14 more attack power. A Great Sword shows it as 48 more. It's important to understand that both of these increases are the exact same. Power Seeds increase your raw ATP by 10. A multiplicative change is something like affinity. When you have positive affinity, you have a chance for your attack to deal 25% more damage. That's a multiplier of 1.25. The more raw damage you have, the more that 25% becomes. Motion values are similar to hit zones. More on that later. 
in that they are multiplied into your weapon's damage, usually reducing it so that some attacks are weaker and some are stronger. Let's say you make a new character, you yoink out that Bone Chris, the starting sword and shield weapon, head out to the snowy mountains and whip out that bad boy pressing triangle while moving forward. You just did the sword and shield's unsheath attack, which is the same one as the triangle and circle attack, the jumping slice. It has a motion value of 18. Let's take a very simplified look at what that means in context of the damage formula. The Bone Chris has an ATP of 98 and a class modifier of 1.4. 98 divided by 1.4 is 70. It also has yellow sharpness, which doesn't change the damage dealt, but the other qualities of sharpness would. So. 70 damage, with a motion value of 18, you multiply the 70 into the 18, after adding a decimal two spaces to the left on 18, that would make it 0 0.18. 70 times 0 0.18 is 12.6. This isn't the end of the calculation, but if it were, we would just drop the decimal point, and that would mean the attack you just did dealt around 12 damage. There's more to it than that, but I think this can help you get a basic understanding of what's going on, and that's the point of this video. Okay, new example. You finish your quest, you go back to the box, grab the bone blade, the starting greatsword weapon. It has an ATP of 336, but a class modifier of 4.8, which means the raw is 70. You go back out into the mountains and charge that bad boy up to the level 3 and let her rip. The level 3 charge attack has a motion value of 110, which means you'll actually be doing a bit extra damage. You move the decimal point over twice, which gives us 1.10. 70 raw times 1.10 is 77. So you go out and level 3 charge onto a popo and you just dealt 100 damage. What gives? Well, like I said, there's more to it than just the motion value. Greatsword also has some other business going on, such as a bonus modifier when hitting with the middle of the blade instead of the tip of it, but this section is only about motion values. Remember, if you took a power seed before attacking, instead of 70 raw damage, you'd use 80. Motion values scale off of your weapon's damage. They're very useful to gauge the damage potential of an attack. Hit zones are values applied to each part of the monster that determine how vulnerable it is to damage. The higher the number, the more damage that part will take. The lower the number, the less damage that part will take. You'll read hit zone values as two or three digit numbers. For example, Yan Kutku's head has a hit zone value of 50 for cutting damage to its head, while Monoblos has a hit zone value of 120 for shot damage to its tail. It's important to understand how to actually use these numbers. You can think of them as percentages. So Kutku's head will take 50% of cutting damage that you hit it with while Monoblos' tail will take 120% shot damage. Almost all monster hit zones will be under 100%. There are a few exceptions, such as Kutku, Mon Monoblos, Plesioth, Cephedrum, etc. And in those cases, it's usually to only one damage type. What weapon you're using will sometimes change what part of the monster you want to aim for to deal the most damage. There's a link in the description to a list of hit zones that I put together, along with a lot of other information. I'm linking my own spreadsheet because I include cut, impact, and shot damage together. I've included links to where I get my information as well, of course. It's from GameFAQs. There's a ton of useful information there for Freedom Unite. So, an extremely simple look at how hit zones work. Let's say your greatsword has an ATP of 480. Its class modifier is 4.8, so that brings it down to 100 raw ATP, that is, without the bloating from the class multiplier. Your greatsword is a cutting weapon, and you hit Kutku with an unsheath attack in the head. The motion value for that attack is 48, so your 100 times 0.48 is 48. That damage is then tested against the hit zone of Kutku's head, which is 50, so 48 times 0.5 equals 24. That's not the whole picture, but you can see how to use hit zones in this way. Let's say you get a new greatsword. It has an ATP of 624, or 130 raw. You walk up to Kutku with your weapon out, and press circle to the roundhouse slash, which has a motion value of 36. That's 130 times 0 0.36, which brings us to 46.8. You hit Kutku's legs, which have a hit zone value of 25, which makes it more resistant to cutting damage than on its head. 46.8 times 0 0.25 equals 11.7. You don't keep decimal points at the end of calculations like this, so that leaves us with 11. With a stronger weapon, you used a weaker attack against a tougher body part, and you did less damage than with your weaker weapon. Using this simplified example, you can see why it's so important to both know your enemy's weak spots, as well as your own motion values, and combine the knowledge of both to deal the most damage. Also on the topic of decimal points, I believe if you ever get buffed and it would result in a decimal point, you drop it there before plugging it into the ATP part of the formula. So. How do you find out how much damage you're doing? This is the formula. ATP times type times critical times sharp times hit zone times defense times rage times variable divided by class. That's a lot of numbers to plug in. So let's go over what each of these are. I want to mention again that a lot of this information, including this formula, is taken directly from the damage FAQ on GameFAQs. Check the description for links. ATP is the damage that's in your status screen. You can either put the damage as you see it in the game here, or divide it by the class multiplier first, and remove the division at the very end of the formula. Either way it works. Type is the type of attack you use. It's the motion value. Feel free to call it that. I'm just calling it type to stay consistent with the guide that I took this information from, hopefully to prevent confusion. Critical is whether or not your strike is critical or not. The only numbers you should put here are 0 0.75, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5, 1.5,
one or 1.25. This is not your weapon's affinity or average affinity. If you want to calculate using the weapon's average affinity, that is 2.5% per 10% of affinity that the weapon has, just calculate that and plug that number into ATP part instead and ignore this one. That's what I do. Sharp is your sharpness level. The length does not matter in terms of individual hit damage. Refer to the sharpness section for more information. Hit zone is the monster's hit zone. Refer to that section for more information. Defense is tied to the rank of the quest. The FAQ that I take this information from isn't really clear on what that means. Here's what it says. Elder and normal quests is 1. That means no damage reduction. Quote unquote hard quests are 0.95, which only means 95% of damage will come through. 5% is negated. 0 0.80 is upper elder. 0 0.75 is higher rank. And 0 0.7 is G rank. I suppose the normal quests would be 1 and 2 star quests in the guild. If 3 star isn't counted as normal, maybe 3 to 5 star quests are considered hard quests, but not high rank. Honestly though, unless you need to know exactly how much damage you're doing for some reason, you don't need to include this. This modifier will apply to all damage types, including bombs and crag and cluster shots. Rage can increase or decrease the amount of damage a monster takes when enraged, or it could have no effect at all. This value is only applied when the monster is enraged, so you can include it if you want, it just depends on why you're using the formula really. I tend to leave this one off. VAR stands for variable. Some weapons have an extra variable attached to them. Good examples are greatsword and longsword giving you a damage buff when hitting the monster with the middle of the blade as opposed to the tip or hilt of it. I usually ignore this one as well. Class is just the final division of the weapon class to remove the bloating. If you don't remove the ATP bloating, your calculation will be wildly inaccurate. Feel free to exclude this part of the formula if you'd prefer to just divide the ATP by the class modifier first. What I'll tend to do is use a shorter version of this formula to get a general idea of how a weapon performs. Mine looks something like this. The raw ATP, after the bloating is taken off, times type, times sharpness, times hit zone. You can even leave off the type or motion value. That'll make it an even more simplified formula. It can be useful for comparing weapons separate from their motion values, because of course, a hammer's golf swing will out damage any of the long sword's individual attacks, but that's not a practical comparison at all. The elemental damage formula is very similar. Element times E sharp times elemental zone times defense, times rage, times variable, divided by 10. Element is the element on your status page. Feel free to divide it by 10 now and remove the end division from the formula. E sharpness is the elemental sharpness modifier. This is separate from the raw sharpness modifier. Typically a lot less drastic of an increase, even with purple sharpness. Check the sharpness part of this video for more information. Elemental zone is the elemental hit zone for the monster. Every monster is more or less resistant to different types of damage on different parts of their body. Refer to the hit zones section for more information. Defense, rage, and variable are all the same as in the raw calculation. The divider is 10. All elemental and status values are bloated by a multiplier of 10 to get the true value, just divided by 10. Again, feel free to just do this and plug that number into the elemental part and ignore this step. That's what I do. What I'll tend to do is something a lot more simple, like the true element, again, divided by 10, times the elemental sharpness, times the elemental hit zone. So this is a ton of information, which is why I wanted to lead up to this explaining more about the inner systems of the game. Hopefully it's not too confusing. I'm gonna give a couple of examples of this formula in action. Example 1. I'm using the Ice Steel Blade, an Ice Elemental Longsword, and I'm fighting Rajang in Nekot's quest. After starting the quest, I find it, run up to it, and unsheathe onto it as it turns to face me. I hit him with the middle of my sword. Let's plug the numbers in. 1008 times 0.33 times 1 times 1.25 times 0.6 times 0.8 times 1 times 1.05 divided by 4.8. This is a mess, isn't it? Let's break it down a bit. 1008 is my weapon's attack power the value in my status screen. 0.33 is the motion value or type of my attack. The one here can be removed since the weapon I'm using has no chance to crit, but I'm leaving it here for consistency. Just skip this part of the formula if your weapon has 0% affinity, or if you don't think you'll crit or negative crit. 1.25 is the sharpness modifier of my weapon, which is blue. 0.6 is the hit zone of Rajang's head. 0.8 is what I believe this quest would have for the defense modifier, since it's in 9 star village elder from Nekot, which is in the end of single player quests. Remember you can leave this part out if you're just doing this to compare weapon since it will apply to every damage type. The one here is the rage modifier, since Rajang hasn't seen me or become enraged yet. Again, you can leave this part out if you want. 1.05 is the bonus for longsword that I get from hitting the monster with the middle of my blade, and 4.8 is the class modifier for longsword. Plug this into the calculator and we get 43.659, or since we dropped the decimal points, 43. Not bad. That's just the raw damage. Let's do the ice damage now. 150 times 1.0625 times 0.3 times 0.8 times 1 times 1.05 divided by 10. 150 is the weapon's ice value in the status menu. 
1.0625 is the elemental sharpness modifier for blue sharpness. 0.3 is the hit zone for ice damage to Rajang's head. 0.8 is, I think, the defense value of this quest. 1 is the rage modifier, he's not in rage when I hit him. 1.05 is the longsword bonus damage from hitting with the middle of the blade. And the 10 at the end is what you divide all elemental values by. You put it in the calculator and we get... 4. Add that to our raw damage and we get the grand total of 47 damage we just dealt to Rajang's head. If I hit him 11 more times in those same conditions, he should be staggered. Maybe not practical, but a little interesting. Okay, next example, same fight. Later on I've made Rajang angry, he's enraged now, and my sharpness has dropped to green. He does a spin attack and I hit him in the leg with my fade slash, but only the tip of the blade connects. 1008 times 0.3 times 1 times 1.125 times 0.45 times 0.8 times 0.8 times 1 divided by 4.8. 1008 is my weapon's ATP. 0.3 is the motion value of the fade slash. The 1 here is because I didn't crit. 1.125 is the green sharpness modifier now, since my weapons dropped down from blue from all the fighting. 0.45 is the hit zone of Rajang's legs. 0.8 is the defense modifier. I think. 0.8 is the rage modifier, since Rajang is enraged now. The one here is because I didn't hit with the middle of my blade, so I don't get the longsword's bonus damage from that. 4.8 is the weapon's class. Plop it into the calculator and we get 20.412, or 20. For the ice element, 150 times 1 times 0.3 times 0.8 times 0.8 times 1 divided by 10. 150 is the ice element of my weapon, 1 is the green elemental sharpness modifier, 0.3 is the ice hit zone for Rajang's head, 0.8 is the defense modifier I think, 0.8 is because he's in rage now, 1 is because I didn't hit with the middle of my sword, and 10 is the elemental divider. We get 2.88 or 2. Add the raw and elemental together, and we just did a fade slash worth about 22 points of damage to Rajang's leg. Assuming his stagger limit is at max, hitting his leg or arm on that same side 16 more times in those same conditions should stagger him. Not practical, just interesting. Maybe. In that example, if I had sharpened back to blue, that damage would have been 25 instead of 22. If I had blue sharpness and he wasn't enraged, it would have been 31. If all of that and I had sharpness plus 1 to get into white sharpness to get a higher sharpness modifier, it would have been 33. You can see how there are so many factors that play into every single hit you deal to a monster. The magic of video games, huh? Again, a more practical and easier to use calculation can be used instead to get a general idea. I went over what I used in the formula section. I just removed some less important variables. So that's about it. Uh, hopefully that was helpful and not too confusing. I'm sure I'm not 100% accurate in some of this stuff, but this should give you some idea as to how this system works. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment, make sure to like and subscribe. And like I said, I use a more simplified formula just to get a general idea of what my weapon's performance will be like, especially when comparing one or two weapons together. Uh, that's what I do for a lot of my videos. When deciding between two weapons, I'll often try and see how much damage they'll do after bloating, after sharpness, after affinity, etc, etc. And then I'll try to compare that damage to others based on the weakest hit zone of whatever monster I'm fighting. I'll try and cover bows, light bow guns, and heavy bow guns at some other time. And if there's anything I missed, I'll try and cover it in an addendum video or something like that as well. So, so yeah, thank you so much for watching, and I will see y'all in the next one. Hope you have a great day. Bye.